I want to welcome everybody back and thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a two-part discussion, or this is part two of our discussion on biblical literacy and its importance. So if uh, you missed last week, I want to encourage you to go back and actually listen to that one first, and uh, then you can join us today as as we continue the the dive into the second part of the importance of biblical literacy and fluency and uh, how we're doing at that. Uh, I'm joined again tonight by uh, Chris Bright and Rick Fales and Ken Parmeter, and uh, we are continuing along in this discussion. And so I want to do a brief recap before we jump in and dive into things. And so first of all, KB, what is biblical literacy and biblical fluency? All right, so I've been pondering a fantastic analogy for this. Oh, uh, yeah. nice. So, All right. <clears throat> kind of like you can't chunk read if you're a Marine. Ooh. Yes. Okay, yes. something yes. like that. There we that. go. Yeah. I really yeah. tried not to say off. that last one. All right, off and yeah. running. But once I heard it, I couldn't <laughs> leave it. Couldn't so. not. Yeah. yeah, it was so good. I'm sitting here biting my tongue Shots not saying that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. You have a filter, I don't. No. <laughs> I almost never have a filter, and most listeners yeah. will be like, what? Right? Yeah. He has yeah. one of those? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, your analogy, so, biblical literacy and fluency. Okay, literacy and fluency. Literacy is the knowledge, the understanding of what the actual Bible says, the person, place, thing, who did what, what was the narrative, what's the point of it, that mm-hmm. kind of a thing. The fluency is the actually understanding, able to apply it to the real life situations, the what is God trying to tell us in that. And my yeah. analogy for that was um, you can speak English, we can we know the words, we can talk in it, but we don't always get all of the phrasing and it doesn't make sense to us. Yeah. And so for me, I had a great moment of this in anatomy lab when I was in chiropractic school. Hmm. When I say anatomy lab, I mean the cadaver lab. Yeah. Now, I, of course, came from a background of hunting. We butchered cows, we butchered deer, all that kind of stuff. I yeah. know my way around a knife and how to use it. And I was doing things how I've done it all my life and not necessarily holding the blade the particular way that the yeah. teachers were telling us and that kind of thing. And the group that I was with was... Um, very city, okay? Yeah. Yeah, very, yeah. very city. And they asked me four or five times, like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why do you hold the knife this way? I'm like, because there's more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah, mm. yeah. And that was <laughs> and an expression. The horrified look on their face. I'm like, well, you've never heard that expression yeah, before? Like you've like, ne- it's yeah. just why an expression. Why is that an expression? Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, so what do you mean? Why is that an expression? It's just why always you can yeah. apps, yeah. right? So you can know the English language, but you don't always get what it means because yeah. I've yeah. never skinned a cat in my life. Yeah. Never intend to. Yeah. I thought it was perfectly applicable, mm-hmm. probably more so than it should have been in a cadaver lab, <laughs> yeah. but greatest use of that, uh, yeah, that uh, phrase ever. Nice. <laughs> but nice. That, that's how I like to think about it. I yeah. Did. We know the English language, but it's not just a person, place, or thing. It's not the words that I put in a particular order. It's what it actually meant, and it didn't yeah. mean that I skin cats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's good. Now, Rick, <laughs> Yeah. why is biblical literacy and fluency important? Well, something we talked about last week, right, was um, wanting to hear God's voice, wanting to hear the Holy Spirit, um, and get to that place where, where that's a recognizable voice. And I think mm-hmm. that... that the more we learn about scripture, the more intelligence we we gather on scripture, um, the the more that can happen. Um, knowing God's call for our life, knowing the way we should be living out as Christians in a secular world is is also um, you know a huge part of that why. And and I would like to also use an analogy here because it helps analogies make things make sense to me. So. Um, you know, I spent 21 years doing intelligence in the Marine Corps, and there's jokes there too. If you really want to lob jokes out, <laughs> oxymoron. You know, there, there's oxymoron. some things. Yeah, the softballs are coming out right now. Yeah, but yeah. so one of the things that was always, um, you know, taught to me, and then I turned around and, and taught to others was, you can have data, you can have information. None of that is anything, and it's not intelligence until you can corroborate it, analyze it, and and make use of it and make it what the word we love to say was actionable. Mm-hmm. And you, you yeah. can do something with it. And you can't do something with one data point. But if you take the data point and you learn it and you learn about it, you corroborate it and you 
analyze it to the point where it's like now I can I can do something with that information. Now you have something, and I think that's where the fluency really comes in. Is yeah. taking taking the literacy aspect yeah. of things, gaining the fluency, and and now you really have growth. I yeah. think and making that's it what the Holy Spirit growth. does in us mm-hmm. yes. when we read it. Sure. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. Why is it important? Because I want to live the way God has called me to live. Yeah. And I don't feel that I can know what that is if I'm not in this book in an intelligent way. So, Ken, how are we doing at this? Both as a country, uh, as individuals, as as our church, the big church. Uh, why is it not all bleak and you have to speak in an analogy or you'll be the one left out? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I would say that, um, yeah, I mean, we talked in the last episode, you know, overall, um, I think that the, at least the, the American church, um, uh, definitely is on the decline as yeah. far as spiritual literacy is concerned. Um, you know, we, we, we hit on a lot of different things, different reasons why. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the, the facts would bear out that, um, it definitely is on the decline. Uh, unfortunately, um, I would say that, um, no, I, I, and I, I think it, I touched on in, in the last episode, as far as our church, I think it's something that has been, um, you know, a, a priority, uh, that, um, is, you know, it's, it's preached on Sunday morning. It's reinforced in small groups and Bible studies and stuff. Um, and I think that's why it's not all bleak. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, scripture says that, you know, the word is living and active and, you know, God is faithful. And, you know, if we, if we want to make this a priority, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to, to open our eyes and is going to, you know, reveal scripture to us in, in great ways. And I think that really taking that step forward, um, for those that are listening, you know, if you're in a good, you know, Bible preaching church, you know, seek it out and it should not be, it it should not be hard to find people to help you along your path. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's one of the things that, um, as, as a recap of, of episode oh, one, I didn't have an analogy. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. Dang it. Boo, That's okay. boo, yeah, yes, boo. Man, boo. <laughs> It'll come to you at midnight. Yeah. 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 I was which, say, which unfortunately which... is not too far <laughs> off. <right? laughs> I was going to say, I wasn't going to make a comment and obviously we have video now. Um, and so anybody watching realize, you know, I don't think I said anything dishonest, but we just took a break to go to the bathroom. So we did. And now we're doing part two, you know? So like obviously yeah. the same clothes. Now on, I took my hoodie yeah. off, so it looks like I'm wearing oh, yeah. different clothes. Oh yeah, you did. You did. Right? Uh, so I, I looked. turn my hat backwards. You had a wardrobe that. change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rick, yeah. Rick totally threw me off. He's like, yeah, we were talking last week. I'm like, that was 10 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah. I was playing you, the game for a minute. Yeah. You got up, you went to the bathroom, got some Oreo cakesters and then, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got a little sugar to, to move forward. <laughs> And so uh, tonight we're going to continue the dive into a little bit more of actually having, uh, putting some of the biblical literacy into practice uh, or or growing some in the biblical literacy and and discussing some things in in important ways um, instead of just going, not that our last episode was just surface, but it was a little more surface. Now we're diving a little deeper. Well, hopefully last episode, hopefully got somebody thinking, yeah. I'd like to become more literate. Yeah. And today we're going to be like, okay, cool. That's yeah. how you do it. So, and, and a little Maybe. bit more of, of diving in. Yeah. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Hmm. So with this in mind, What is the importance of actually making sure that you interpret scripture with scripture? So there's, there's some benefits of, you know, scripture all being given from God. And a lot of times we'll interpret scripture with other things, but why is it absolutely necessary to interpret scripture by scripture? I mean, short answer. So you get it right. Yeah. (laughs) Right. I mean, that's kind of like the Bible for dummies answer, but I mean, that's, 
so you get it right. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's zero room for error there. Yeah. It's also it, known as the law of hermeneutics. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Scripture interprets scripture. And if scripture contradicts scripture, that'd be an issue. Right. In fact, that's one of the places that the people who are Bible literate, but non-believers who are atheistic, that's where they go. They try to go to those gotcha moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can, without context and without <clears throat> interpreting scripture, scripture, you can find them. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, in scripture, you know, you can, you can pull those isolated things out and get those, you know, pseudo gotcha moments, but you know, getting deeper into scripture and looking at, you know, what's being said, the context and everything else really, it's not there. In general, I tend to find that the things that are seeming contradictions are some of the greatest places for teaching. They are. Yeah. Because, you know, you can take that person who says, see, God had David or whoever, you know, destroy that entire town, women, children, everything, everybody, what kind of a loving God would have someone destroy and kill, you know, and see, so gotcha, you don't serve a loving God. That's not possible. He's killing babies. But with literacy and fluency, and you look at the totality of scripture and you you get someone to realize, okay, so there's a lineage here to a Messiah that's being preserved and protected. There's, you know, when you look at the, uh, the, the total sovereignty of the plan that's being carried out, um, it doesn't completely, I don't think, eliminate all the questions. You can still, I think, and not even wrongfully, have that mentality of, right, but women and children? But at least you would have the understanding of the necessity of, of what happened there and how this played into a, a, a sovereign, long-standing plan. Um, God you, never does anything on a whim like that. Right. If you're only looking at it on the surface... Yeah, that that's probably not looking good. Yeah, absolutely. What do you mean God never does anything on a whim like that? Well, that was actually one of my favorite questions to ask, like, the uh, the Sunday school kids. And by kids, mm-hmm. I mean, like, the high schoolers who mm-hmm. might have a hope of answering that question. Yeah. It's like, okay, now defend God. Then you just sit there and drink coffee while they look at you like, no, this wasn't rhetorical. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> um, and the one is I always use is uh, when they're going into Jericho. And mm-hmm. not only the men, women, children, they're supposed to slaughter all the livestock, livestock. burn all the grain, yeah, everything, everything, lock, stock, and barrel. It is completely destroyed. Well, except for the prostitute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Except, except for Rahab. Yes. Except for Rahab. Yeah. Who is in the lineage of Jesus? Yes. Yeah, oh, I know. Right. I know. Yeah. I, and just, in the Hall of Saints. Uh, just, but, yeah, in the Hall of Saints. Right. And you, how is that a loving God? Well, you look back at that and go, those are the, that's the exact same people group that was persecuting, uh, say, like back in the Abrahamic times. Mm-hmm. And, in, you know, hey, you're going to go to a place, you're going to be there for 400 years, your, your uh, descendants are going to come back here, and this is eventually going to be your land. Yeah. And why is it not now? Well, because their iniquity is not complete. And we can look in other places in Scripture. Rahab is a great place. Yeah. Um, we heard what your God did. You know, God might have been the God of the Israelites, but the other nations there saw that. There's mm-hmm. a reason the Philistines thought that he was a god of the the hills, but not the valleys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they still knew yes, him. Sir. They still understood that he was a god. This god happened to be the capital G god, not the lowercase g god. But th- the point was, they knew they had that time in which to hear about him, to come yeah. into a place where if you were going to repent, if you wanted to seek out the Israelites your judgment, your iniquity was not yet complete. And so at a certain point, we're all going to face judgment. We all have to sit before the throne. Mm -hmm. And whether it's in Jericho or, you know, after the tribulation, there's going to come that point in time. Yeah. It's just a matter of how it gets there. And he's still a loving God. He gave them 400 extra years. Mm -hmm. He could have done it then. Absolutely. And I think there's also an element that, uh, and <clears throat> so it's it's hard for me to put this into words because it's hard for my mind to wrap my head around it at times. But there's an element of knowledge that the Holy Spirit will reveal to us as we continue to seek Him and continue to read Scripture. There's also an element of God's sovereignty and God's plan that if I understood 
would he really be worthy for me to serve him as God? Mm, yeah. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. I, and, and so like, I'm not going to get it all, even though I think it is, I think it's wise to seek understanding. Right. And then trust in God's sovereignty of what he's going to give me understanding of and what he's not. But like, man, yeah, there, there's this, this element that is, is definitely a trust in him. Um, and that got us off of the interpreting scripture with scripture a little bit. Well, to go back to that real quick, like, so interpreting scripture with scripture, I think, and and 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, I think is our defense against false teachings. Mm -hmm. It's our defense against um, what the secular world is trying to tell us about the very scriptures that we claim we read and and are holy. I think it's what gives us the the ability uh, to, you know, even... And I love that the Federated is this way because I've recognized not every church is this way. But, you know, our pastors, when you guys preach, you welcome, hey, don't take my word for it. If you've got a question or if you disagree, if you went, huh, you know, you know, check us on the scripture and come back and we'll have a conversation about it. Um, and that openness that we do foster in this church, and, and many churches do. But you know, it's it's this scripture right here, this passage that I think really gives us that defense against false teachings, and we're going to need it um, a lot in this world, especially in the years to come. Sure, I mean, I you know, I I've attended the Fed for a long time, but I mean, I, from time to time, I have gone to other churches, mm-hmm. you know, for various reasons and stuff, and certainly, you know, I've been in a church where, like, to echo what you're saying, Rick, like I've been in a church where. You know, you're sitting and you're listening to somebody talk for 30, 35, 40 minutes, and there's no scripture. Hmm, right. Know, they're just talking, you know, and, you know, the, <laughs> when, when the pastors here preach, I mean, there is scripture one after another, after yep. another, you know, and that's, that's something that, you know, is hugely important. It is. Um, and it's always a red flag for me if, you know, if I'm sitting listening to somebody and, you know, there's no scripture coming up, you know, mm-hmm. no, no scripture being used to back up what's being said. You know, that's, that's just a massive red flag. So this is a little bit, uh, going down this trail. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess it, not that it matters. It wasn't necessarily planned, but I'd love to hear a discussion of, uh, before we move forward, not just interpreting scripture with scripture, but how this guards against false doctrine and what are some examples and it doesn't need to be specific but what are some examples that you've experienced in your life where someone has said this is my justification for my actions this scripture and you're like no 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 no. you're doing a, a one verse theology can i present a very obvious example to that yeah that we've all seen it's not in like my personal life but what 10, 15, 20 years ago, Westboro Baptist Church was a really big deal in America. Why? Because they were out there on the streets saying the things that I won't even say on this microphone, right? But like, you know, using one scripture, one verse, one passage to say that God hates this group or that Mm -hmm. this particular group is going to hell no matter what. And they were so vocal about it. And they were made sure they got on the news every chance they got. They were a representation of Christianity, whether we like it or not, mm-hmm. right. um, to, a, to, a, to a secular world. And I remember being so angry and irritated by what they were representing, by, by the fact that they were doing this under the banner of being a Christian church or organization. And, and it, you know, there's so many other scripture that talks about how to address sin, how sure. to address um, you know, the, the, the waywardness of our world and what they were doing was not it. And there's a lot of other scripture that would, would, that would make, that would, that would hold them so accountable. Um, and, but they were just focusing and isolating on one thing and making that the hill to die on. And in the process, in my opinion, um, hurting our, our, what our faith looks like to an unbelieving world. It, it was, it disappointed me so, so badly. Yeah. I wanted to, <laughs> never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can think of one, one, one time that comes to my mind and uh, it's actually something that comes to my mind fairly frequently. Um, back when I was at Penn state bear and taking the bio classes and everything, I was part of a uh, small group Bible study there. 
and we happened to be having a Bible study one night when a group of Muslim students came walking through. Mm -hmm. And we had some great talk and dialogue back and forth, and one of them was like, regardless, we don't think Christianity is right, we think, you know, Islam is. And one of them went so far as to go through and print out, like, 50 different questions or whatever of uh, proofs of mm. Islam. And the only one that sticks in the back of my head was um, Jesus in the garden saying, um, Lord, if this cup can be taken from me, like, mm -hmm. I don't want to do it. No, of course, that's not yeah. a direct quote. I don't, but yeah. And then, like, and then it goes into this whole paragraphs of like, you know, this is, you know, Jesus said he didn't want to do it. He obviously never died on the cross, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, Oh my gosh, it finished the verse, yet not by my will, but by yours. Yes, like literally, yes. like, like in the, the same, same yeah. verse after the comma. Mm -hmm. you, you cut the sentence off halfway. Right, you know, right. exactly. Like you didn't even finish your thought. <laughs> yeah. But that's the the misleading that they go for. Yeah. And so I went through and I answered some of these questions. I went so far as to carry these these this list of papers that this kid printed out for like a year and a half. Never yeah. saw him again on campus mm. until this is the end of my junior or senior year. I can't remember. And I was in the middle of, of uh, finals prep, and he came walking into the computer lab that I was studying, and to my everlasting shame, I'm like, I'm in the middle of finals. And I just continued studying, and I did not go up and talk to him. Yeah. And to this day, whenever I think of that, I pray for that guy. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I was given an opportunity right there to go and witness to somebody, and I did not take it because I was not living on mission. I was distracted by good things as finals. I have to study for finals. You, you had an obligation. I but but your, I should your have first been, obligation right? I should have been yes. living on mission doing yeah. what I needed to do and gone talk what would it talk what would it cost me 15 minutes yeah maybe yeah and yet I didn't do it yeah so that's something that stuck with me but that is classically what they do and many of the other uh, religions false religions is they will miss intentionally misrepresent scripture cut it off in half. Or in the case of like Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll take certain scriptures out of there so that when you want to go back and prove to something and you have their Bible in your hands, those scriptures aren't there because right. they would disprove what they want to yeah. prove. And right. that goes back to Second Timothy, you know, absolutely all scripture. Yes. Not just the scripture you want, but all scripture. Well, and, and that's that like, goes... that's the first big warning sign, you mm -hmm. know, when, you know, it, I, I think of... You know, uh, prior to coming to the Fed, I was part of the, we were, our family was part of the Methodist denomination. You know, and that's mm. obviously split massively over the yeah. the issue of homosexuality. Um, you know, I as far as you know, as far as answering your question, I mean, you can. I cannot think of a person that I know that drinks. You know, that knows the you know. A little wine is good for the, you know, is, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you know, that bit and, you know, prosperity doctrine, twisting, oh, um, absolutely. twisting proverbs. Um, I've heard lots of times, um, you know, a big argument of David and Jonathan being homosexual and that mm. justifies homosexuality. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, there's, there's and, numerous <laughs> scripture twisting that I can think of. So if you guys remember back an episode when we talked about David and Jonathan and I brought this up and I still get scoffed at for it, but whatever, I don't really care. I don't care if David and Jonathan had a homosexual relationship. What part of sexual relationship are you looking at David for? Right, right. Like, look at his transgression. Like, look at all the like the the failing in that area. Yeah. So, for me, it's it's inconsequential whether he did or didn't in trying to justify. Because with that thought process, because right. I've heard people use that. Sure. With that thought process, then it's fine if I cheat on my wife and you yeah. know, you know, get someone else pregnant and and kill, kill my their best husband. friend. You know, like, <laughs> right. yeah. you know, like what? Yeah. It's a slippery you know? slope right there. <laughs> yeah. So, and I think, and, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, especially when we talk about false teaching in the church, that we, we have to look at scripture, especially prosperity gospel. Um, the reason you're suffering right now is because of sin in your life. Yeah. You, if, if you are following Christ, then you will not have any issues. Retribution principle. Yeah, I know. I was just saying, goes back just, to Job. Yeah. Didn't you just preach on that? <laughs> I did. And uh, also, like, and, and I've heard this justification because, yes, uh, Colossians 3.23 instructs us, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart is working for the Lord, not for men. 
that does not mean to neglect your family because of your job. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And I've, I've, I've heard that, but you sure. could use that verse and be like, this is why I'm doing my best and doing everything I can and getting all the hours I can in to advance because I'm doing it in the honor of God. Mm-hmm. Yes. But scripture also tells you serve your wife like Christ served the church, <laughs> you know, like, and then all of yes. the, the scriptures about parenting, you know, right. so having that totality yeah. of scripture is, is so crucial. Fluency. One might yes. call that. Yes. One yeah. might. <laughs> yes. Oh, so good. So why, why use anything else? So we have scripture interpreting scripture. Yep. What is the use? And we've talked about uh, whether it's commentaries, uh, you know, other sermons, uh, the, just articles that are that are good, whatever it might be. Why use anything else? This is where discernment has to come in, mm-hmm. yeah, because it's important what you're using to supplement. Um, you know, checking it against, um, you know, being biblical, uh, yeah. being uh, from from the right place. So, in in this. So why use anything else? Because the Bible can be... Yes. Because, and what I was going to say is the Bible can be, it can be difficult to understand. And there's, if it's coming from a, another biblical source, you know, a different way of looking at it can always be a great thing. It's also why groups are vastly important. And I, and I truly appreciated what, what Ken said about, um, you know, the importance of groups and Bible studies because iron does sharpen iron. And, you know, the, the, the best growth I've had has been because I talked to a, to a fellow believer, a brother about a passage and they they shared with me how they view that and what it means to them. And, and that, and it would be entirely different maybe than what I was thinking or how I was viewing it. And then, you know, we can discuss that and really look at things differently. It's the same thing with these other sources podcasts and other sermons and other mm-hmm. uh, commentaries and um you know bible hub right diving into the, the every word of the verse and the greek like all of that can really uh play in so yes at the end of the day scripture interpreting scripture and making sure that that podcast that that having the discernment which can be tricky but that that it is biblically based and that is they are coming from uh, a like-minded, you know, uh, uh, biblically sound place uh, before you use it as um, some kind of a gospel en- enhancement. But um, yeah, I, I just think that there's there's a lot of value in looking at things differently. And, you know, scripture can be difficult and sometimes it's good to get a, just a different perspective. And that's what these sure. other things do. Part of what scripture, interpreting scripture means is if you look at, uh, pick any term, uh, one that's coming to mind is uh, sons of God. Yeah, in in the Old Testament, right? It's used five particular times, and in most of those, or in every one of those, it's um, uh, Jesus when he was, or an angel when he was in the uh, the furnace with Shadrach, yeah. Meshach, and Abednego, mm-hmm. or it's the throne room of heaven that we see in Job, where mm-hmm. Satan and all the rest of the angels are there in those couple different places. It's like. Okay, if it means an angelic deity type, you know, not human, then sons of God in, in Genesis, with that exact same term, doesn't mean Adam. Yeah. Right. It, it's referencing. So when you're talking scripture, interpreting scripture, it can't mean one thing in one place and one thing in another place mm-hmm. if it's not commonly used that way. And so from a mechanical standpoint, that's what scripture interpreting scripture means is it can't mean one thing here, one thing there, or else you have no foundation to build upon. Yeah. Yes. Now, I guess to, to answer your question about why use anything else, and I'm going to, I'm going to say this, I'm going to clarify it and it make it edited out later. I'm not sure. <laughs> but so I'm going to get a little squirrely. I like where this is going. All right. but, yeah. Sounds like fun. <laughs> I'm going to say because Jesus did it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by that is when Jesus was on the earth and he was teaching, they had the Old Testament. Yes. You know, <laughs> what we know is the Old Testament. That's it. Yeah. You know, and Jesus 
came onto the earth and he starts laying out parables and he starts teaching and he, uh, I mean, the Beatitudes and I mean, a lot of that contextually, you know, is still coming from the Old Testament, yeah. but he is literally, you know, without taking anything out or throwing anything away, I mean, in a way he is rewriting and, and re- Properly interpreting. Yeah. There you go. Properly interpreting scripture. And, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not here saying that anyone nowadays has the teaching authority of Jesus in any way, shape or form as a point of clarification. But, um, as far as having, you know, interpretation and, and different things and different ways to look at scripture or just adding, you know, historical context to things Mm -hmm. like Rick was talking about earlier. Um, I mean, Jesus during his teaching, he, he was using other things to teach. And, and I think that that's, I mean, if you're going to have an example, that's a great one to follow. Mm -hmm. No. And that's, that's very true. Um, and so as, as we realize that scripture must interpret scripture and we, we cannot justify any verse alone, you know, and have it contradict other scriptures and just the importance of all of that. Um, there's also the element as, as we move forward of the Holy spirit revealing certain mysteries of scripture to each of us. Uh, and this, this happens, uh, individually at different times and different seasons. Uh, we talked about that a little bit last episode and why we don't understand, you know, Hey man, when I read this first, when I was 20, it didn't, it didn't mean what it means to me now. Right. Um, it's cause you're old Mal. Yeah, I know. Mm. <laughs> hey, here's, <laughs> here's hope for me though. Uh, Dr. Ed Huntley, I love in staff meetings, mm. which he is as read, um, as, as most people I've ever met. And he's also very humble about it. But when he's like, man, I, I've never, you know, the Holy Spirit has never, you know, showed me this about this verse before. And and he'll bring something up and it's like, man, in his 70s, someone who's read through scripture countless times, done countless studies, it, yeah, the Holy Spirit is still revealing. Um, but anyways. Even Dr. Ed hasn't hit that 100% yes, yet. Yes, he has I, not. He I, has I, not. Uh, each of us will have that light bulb moment with passages. And sometimes it comes early, sometimes it comes late. So, uh, yeah, I would love to hear from you why this is the way it is. Um, why is it that you have a new revelation about a, a scripture that you've read 50 times and now all of a sudden it clicks in a different way? Or it you were revealed a certain truth about the scripture, but, you know, 20 years later... Um, as I'm getting older, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden it's a different truth. It doesn't mean the first one wasn't legit, but like, why, why is that? And how is this? Um, I've never necessarily possible. experienced the issue of like 20 years ago, this was a truth. And then like the truth quote unquote changed. I haven't experienced any, I don't think aspect of that, but I have absolutely experienced like the one thing I can think of is First Timothy one seven is a verse that, that I've just grown to absolutely love lately, and it's the it's about how we've been given a spirit of power, not a spirit um, of fear, um, you know, a, a spirit of hope, a spirit of. So, I remember a few years ago hearing a sermon at a church I was attending in Virginia, and I mean the pastor went so far as to even kind of quote that scripture in a song that he used to sing himself to help him through different trials in life. And I remember that sermon, it was a good sermon. Um, but that didn't click with me in a powerful way. It just, did, I, I remember, I remember thinking great sermon. Yeah. But then when I was, when I would encounter, it didn't click with me in a way that when I encountered some kind of adversity that that would, um, hit me or, or, or that I would reflect on it until I really hit adversity until I really, was w- walking in a valley. And then I came, I forget how I came back upon that scripture other than to say the Holy spirit led me to it, but I can't remember yeah. if somebody specifically directed me to it or if I just found it one day uh, in devotions. I, I, that part I don't remember, but I remember I read that verse 
and I had a tearful, eye-opening, light bulb on, clicked moment. And then I remembered almost like word for word that sermon. And it's like, there was this moment of like, everything came together and that verse became the thing I would recite to myself the same way that pastor had preached years before. And it helped get me through some dark times. Um, you know, but previously it just didn't click. Why did it, why did all that happen in that moment? Well, I don't know, but the spirit, you know, made it so right. Like the, yeah. in that moment, um, it just, uh, hit me in a completely different way in a way that actually was, was, I feel like saying life altering might be dramatic, but okay. I'm a dramatic person. So life altering, like it, it <laughs> helped. Marine. Yeah. And red crayons are the best. So it helped in a very real way. So, you know, it just, sometimes we're ready to hear a verse and it click and sometimes we're not. And yeah. the spirit is going to guide that. And um, we can't, I don't think we can, I don't think it's too fruitful to give a lot of thought of, well, man, why didn't I get that when I was 20? Cause I have asked that question. Why didn't, why did that passage not make sense when I was 20 years old? Why, when I was 15, did I not realize there was so much more to Jonah than just being swallowed by a fish? Like yeah. read that book. Now there are elements of that book and elements of the story of Jonah that are way more fascinating than the fact that he got swallowed by a fish. Never mind the miracle that that was. It's just, when I was when I was ten or when I was five, understanding the 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 the, um, the palm tree was it a palm tree or fig tree? Understanding the tree that he sat under and the significance of what the Lord did with that tree, yeah. understanding the totality of like why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh and why it was so important that he did, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Like at five at ten, I wasn't going to understand that in a way that was going to be meaningful at all in my life, but at thirty, it sure made sense to me and and I could apply it right. So. Yeah, the spirit's going to reveal things about scripture to us. The the importance is to stay in it and stay at it until those mysteries are revealed, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're yeah. not going to reveal themselves just by accident if we're not in scripture. And I think there's a I mean there is a lot of variables to that too. I mean there's, you know, physical maturity like you're talking about. I mean there's spiritual maturity. There's the way that it's being taught or presented you know, yep. the, the context, the, you know, I mean, I've sat through and, and certainly, you know, you know, I've read different scriptures and, you know, I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's good or, you know, whatever. But then I'm going through something in my life, you know, and I hear, you know, and I go to church and, you know, Mal preaches a sermon that, I mean, it's like he could have written that sermon specifically to me, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and because, those passages that I've read a dozen times, you know, and I've maybe even heard sermons preached on them before, you know, it, but it, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to meet us where we are. Yeah. And God knows infinitely more than ourselves what we need. Right. You know, and I mean, there, there, there are just so many different variables why, why we have those light bulb moments. But when we have those light bulb moments, it's because the Holy Spirit is working in our lives and because God wants us to have them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're going to have a lot more of them if you're actively seeking God. Right? Yeah. And I think for me, it also goes back to Hebrews 4.12. You know, living, living and active. active. And active. Oh. Like, the, the Word of God is living and active. And um, I can think of a number of times, and again, there's different truths to different scriptures based on seasons and part of it is because the application to being a parent didn't apply to me 10 sure. years ago, you know, well, it, it, November 1st, it'll be 10, you know, our, our oldest turns 10, but like, yeah, 11 years ago, like, yeah, I, I can, I still tried to learn how to be a parent, but like that was part of my life, you know, like I wasn't. So <clears throat> it, you know, even you said like the, the, the desire and the yearning to understand mm -hmm. scripture grew so much more when it's like, I need to justify this to my kids. Right. Like I need to, I need to be able to speak to the truth of this to my kids. And so that, you know, things change, you know, and as seasons change, there's going to be different things that the Lord reveals to you. Um, and I mean, just going back to the example from pastor Ed, his life has 
taken some turns that he has shared and we all know Mm -hmm. that were not expected, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And so when that happens, scripture will illuminate differently. Uh, You know, it's, it's great to, to hear all of the promises of God being our strong, like our strength and our fortress and all of those things when life's fine. (laughs) And then, then when the mess of the world comes, it's like, Oh, is this actually, is this truly his character? You know, can I trust that it's his character? Um, And I think that's where it, it, yeah, like that's how it can be something different depending on the season that you're going through. One of the key things um, that we realize the difference as we read scripture is knowing uh, the, I think one of the key elements is, is it prescriptive or descriptive? I think we might've mentioned this in the first episode. Maybe. But there's, you know, as, as we continue to look at, the importance of knowing scripture and you talked about the background Mm -hmm. and how like there's so many other elements of what uh, is something that impedes you from chunk reading or volume reading, uh, like wanting to know all these different things. I think one of the, the keys to know as you do dive into scripture is, is this prescriptive or descriptive? So what do I mean by that? Hmm. And How do we tell the difference? From a definitional standpoint, you can describe how something happened. Um, You can describe that there were believers in the book of Acts who became believers and they started to speak in tongues before there was any praying, before there was any baptism, before there was anything else. Does it have to happen that way every time? No. Mm -hmm. Um can somebody be filled with the Holy Spirit when they're baptized? Yes. Do they have to be baptized for that? No. There's a descriptive of how it happened in that narrative, in that literacy understanding narrative. And then there are things in scripture that are, this is the way it is. Those certain truths um, or prescribing the way that it has to be. You know, a case in point would be, this is how you have to do things in the Old Testament. This is how the sacrificial system works. Yeah. And the reason that does is because it points forward to Christ, Mm -hmm. right? So in in a definitional place, some things have to be the way they are, and some things, this is just describing how it occurred. Yeah. And as Christian, this is just a question. I'm being a slightly devil's advocate. This isn't in what we wrote here, but it just came to me. I'd like to talk about it. Without saying what I think, as Christians, is the entirety of the Old Testament descriptive then? And what I mean is, is it just a history book for us? The Ten Commandments still exist? They do. Again, I'm not saying how I feel, just as a discussion point, because this because this is what some this is a discussion point among um I think a lot of the secular world as well is like because a lot of times what's thrown at us as 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 Christians, a lot of times is you know, um the don't just things that happen in the old testament that don't seem characteristic of a loving uh, a faith that, that preaches love or a God that has love as a character backbone. Um, so to what extent is now the old Testament, because Jesus came and set a new, there's a new covenant. So <clears throat> just as a discussion point, like, is the Old Testament, like as Christians, how much weight should we be putting in the Old Testament? I think we answered this question earlier in a roundabout way. We may when have. We were talk- when Ken was talking about Jesus and how he taught. He only had the Old Testament to teach from. And he took the yes. proper understandings mm-hmm. of the Old Testament things and told parables that set up all of the New Testament understandings. Mm-hmm. Almost like everything that we had in the Old Testament was... Not wrong, but Jesus gave us a clarity to it mm-hmm. that was not present or veiled 
before the proper time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Were you going to add something, Ken? No, I well, sort of, but then Chris kind of, yeah. So okay, yeah, I'm good. <clears throat> and I think there was the the Old Testament um, where where I feel part of it becomes descriptive, not prescriptive. Like you touched base on earlier, is also like the law was fulfilled. Yeah, like Jesus came to fulfill the law, mm-hmm. and when he did, yes, that made a lot of the sacrificial system become descriptive instead of prescriptive because mm-hmm. it was prescriptive up until that point. Sure. But that doesn't mean that everything is just descriptive. And that can be right? difficult. Discerning, Absolutely. And, discerning what yeah. is still descriptive yeah. or uh, prescriptive and, and that's what the became question descriptive. Is, how do you tell the difference? Yeah. And this is a conversation I was literally just having with my dad today. Um, oh, to be a fly on the wall for that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like no, I, I mean, we were, yeah. ta- we were talking <laughs> about, you know, there is so much in, in kind of what you were mentioning, Rick. Uh, I mean, there is so much now teaching, mm-hmm. like, you know, God is a God of love, forgiveness, everything else. I mean, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the same God who who told the Israelites to go in and kill everybody in the kill every land. last Amalekite they could find. It, yeah. And, and did, you know, did to Job what he did to Job or allowed to happen to Job, yes. what he yeah. allowed to happen to Job. Yep. Um, I mean, that's the same God that we serve today. Right. And it, it's very easy to, uh, like my friend Lee says, you know, to, to look at the God, you know, the God of fuzzy bunnies, and not the the god of you know who god is in totality yeah and to it's a very very slippery slope and dangerous thing to just take god and put him in this box that is appealing to the masses literally any time you start to and it's tough we've got to check ourselves sometimes any time you start to put god into any kind of box right. you're more than likely wrong yeah well so uh, let me push back on that a little bit I, yeah. I know what you're saying yeah but we absolutely oh man i was just gonna say god was god is bound by scripture so it's it's not but i don't feel like yeah, so, I know what, he's bound by his own word yeah he's bound i mean He's bound by the fact that so bound might be the wrong word. So right. help me unpack this. Okay, he but he's not never, gonna, he's not gonna contradict himself. Yes, he will never us. go against scripture. Right. Yeah. He will never make a mountain too heavy that he can't lift it. <laughs> so he <laughs> oh, so this, man. but this speaks to and I'm so, glad we're so doing I guess this. yeah, like this, I mean, I guess that doesn't put him in a box necessarily. But there are truths about God's character that that I can put him in that box. There are unchanging because truths. he has said yes. that. Yes. There are unchanging exactly. truths. He has put himself that. in that. Yeah. Yes. You're not putting him there. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And this speaks to a term that we did kind of gloss over, but I want to I want to say the term and I want to define it and talk about it and and honestly talk about if we believe it. And I'm talking to the people listening to this right now as well because it's it's an important hurdle. That if we're talking about biblical literacy, we've got to clear it. Sola Scriptura, like the the idea that the Bible, Scripture is the authoritative, complete, the infallible Word of God, infallible, total truth. And if you have any shred or percentage of doubt about that, you're going to run into issues with Scripture interpreting literally everything we're talking about, yeah. right? Like, Here, here's a fantastic question for you. Is yes. this Bible I'm holding in my hand the written and inspired word of God? Right. And your answer, I mean, it's... My answer is a gotcha one doubt. because it's actually no. The scripture as it was written in the original language well, okay. is the written and inspired word of God. This is a translation yeah. of it. And yeah. there are things that are lost in translation. Which is why we have to read into this and deep dive into this because we don't understand the culture and we don't understand the context and meaning of every single word as it was spoken, as the original hearers would have. Right. So, but that's not contradicting Sola Scripture. It's not. Right. Which, Sola Scripture, Scripture alone. Right. For those who haven't picked up on that. So speak to Which, Scripture alone. like Because, yeah, because we, we asked this question already, but let's quickly revisit it. Why use anything else if, if, 
if this is a truth, solar scripture, scripture alone, um, is, is there anything wrong about me saying, I don't understand that. Let me hear what Piper has to say. Is that a sin? Is it a sin to go and have a discipleship relationship to talk with to another believer of course about, not. which is yeah. of course the answer right. to that. Right. So what is it except this is not someone you personally know, but somebody who is a well-studied, quote unquote, air quotes, authority mm -hmm. on the topic, weighing in on it. Who's got some maturity, who's been there, done that, who's who's evaluated this for themselves numerous times enough to write on it. And is probably older than the people sitting at this table. Yes. <laughs> yes. As no. long as we all remember, <laughs> as believers, as people who are on a quest for biblical literacy, as long as we remember that even somebody like MacArthur, Piper, <laughs> Nolan, <laughs> Pastor Ed, um, that when we might want to hear their insights on scripture, we would do well to still take what we think we've learned from that person as a grain of salt and get back to scripture and confirm it there too. Yeah, absolutely. Because sure, that's when the full not, circle yeah. happens, yeah. isn't it? Because it's, it's a <clears throat> no matter how much I respect a, a variety of number of uh, theologians, whatever mm -hmm. experts, you know, what, what they have written is not scripture. Right. Right. Absolutely. So like that, there, there's a difference. And I think that's where, that's what goes back to the, you know, the solo scripture and, and just the, yeah, like the, the importance of having that as our basis, but still looking. I, I want to, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, and anything can be dangerous when taken to an extreme. Yeah. I yes. Mean, okay. So solo scriptura, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to hear you. Oh, I, know. I, have I don't the need Bible to hear you in my preach. home. Yeah. I've got the Bible in my home. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, it but actually against the need for a sermon because you go up and read the scripture and that's yes. all that needs to be said. You right. don't have yep. to explain it. Right. Yep. But, and yep. again, going back to the example of Jesus, I mean, Jesus still went to synagogue. Yeah. You know, they got up, they read, you know, scripture mm -hmm. and then they taught on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and. It, it, Going back, I always try, whenever I wrestle with anything, the first thing I do is I go to scripture and I try to look and see it. If there is an example that Jesus did, that's yeah. probably a safe bet. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Like, to, <laughs> right. Yeah. And like, well, it and would be the, wise. And in the yeah. same conversations, what you just said, if I'm looking at something in scripture that's confusing to me, let's just throw out a very random, arbitrary topic, Paul's views on women or whatever, right? Or, or on women being teachers, leaders, pastors. Sure. You know, just take... Maybe that's a bad example. I'm just saying, as any example, what I, if it's confusing or if it's a mystery or if it's debatable or whatever the word is, I will typically then try to turn to a gospel, right? Somewhere else in scripture and see, yeah, like you said, did Jesus speak about this? Because that's going to be a really good place to go. Now, not always. Right. He did not speak on every single topic. Sure. Um, which is why the example I probably use is probably bad because <laughs> quite frankly, Jesus... Never mind. Um, well, we're not going to get into frankly, Jesus versus Paul. We don't Paul. all agree around this table about some agree. of the stuff that you right. uh, just said. So that was so. a wretched example. It was just yeah. unfortunately the first one that popped into my mind. But the yeah. point is using scripture, going back and finding other parts of scripture that are going to talk yeah. about the same topic because that probably does exist. And and then, yeah, going from there. And I mean, it again, it, it does go back to seeking the Holy Spirit. It does. To give discernment um, to the original question of descriptive versus prescriptive, right? You yeah. know that can be a it, that's a tough one. It, it just oh, it is. is. It can be yeah. hard when you're reading. Like, are they describing the culture? It almost like you could get a better sense of this if you have better biblical literacy and yeah. be better biblical. Fluency. I love how you keep I bringing us back talk. to that. That's at least the second or third time where you've like, sounds right. like yes. literacy yes. and fluency. Yes. It's almost like <laughs> yeah. this is applicable in the purpose of us talking about yes. this. Yeah. Right. And I Absolutely. love how you keep bringing us back home and with that. Gentle and club over the head. Yes. Yeah. Yes. hundred percent. And, and that's, that is the, <laughs> the importance. Yes. And, and to continue to go back and to continue to seek scripture. Now, one of the other things that obviously, and we're not going to do a, a major deep dive into this, but, but I, I think there's, there's a, uh, merit and value to at least speak on this a little bit. Um, one of the, the issues that people can push back on is the, 
uh, how was scripture as we know it today compiled and canonized? Yep. Like, how is it that our book of the Bible, you know, or I mean, our our version of the Bible, the Protestant version, has sixty six books, and the Catholic Bible has seventy two books. Like, what what made it? What didn't? How did it make it? And and not like why are things left out and all that? So, I guess, uh, can we speak a little bit to how scripture? came to be what it is. Um, and yeah, I was going to say just a little bit, uh, whether we go into detail about some of the councils and, you mm-hmm. know, some of the beliefs of like, well, this, this ruler just put it this way to try to manipulate and gain power, you know, and, and all those different things. But uh, speak to it a little bit of how did scripture become the 66 books that we have today? So if you want to start beginning the the Old Testament, you've got the Torah, you've got what's written yeah. by Moses, then you have all of the other books, all of the prophets, and the Jews had a fantastic record-keeping system where yes. anybody who claimed to be a prophet, everything was written down. Then if it was found that you were not a prophet and your prophecies did not come to pass, you were then executed. Um, <laughs> Which I mean, imagine the pressure. If your prophecies did come to pass, you were yeah. executed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that did happen. Yeah. 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 But imagine yeah. the pressure of that. Yeah. Right? yeah. Like, I, I was talking with KB about this, and like, I wonder how many... Yeah, I wonder how many would-be prophets, like, if how much that interfered with their willingness to be obedient to God, knowing what was on the line if God's timing didn't match up with what the people expected it to be. Like some of the, this was serious business. If you claimed to be a prophet, if you claimed to speak for the Lord or not speak for the Lord, to to be speaking words that the Lord gave you, um, there better be some, some pudding somewhere with some proof in it or yeah, you're so, but to KB's point, like, the uh, the bar was high. Mm-hmm. The bar was high. Yeah. So those books that the Jews, the the rabbis studied, um, those were for the most part well agreed upon for hundreds of years before Jesus. Yeah. I don't remember the council of rabbis that got together. If it was even called the council. Yeah, I don't know of a name that it had. I have no idea. But it was well, about 250 yeah. years before. I mean, to a degree, though, because you still had schisms within the Jewish faith between the Sadducees, the Pharisees, yeah, and absolutely. so on and so forth. Yeah. But, yeah I mean, I'm simplifying things yeah. for the sake of not making this five parts. Yeah. But those were disagreements yeah. really on principles anyway, not so much the canonization of yeah. writings. Right. But what Jesus had as the, uh, the Old Testament, the accepted canon of Scripture— um, was the same as that they had about 250 or 500 years, not maybe not 500 years before that, yeah. but about 250 years before Jesus, there was a gathering, not so much to say, we're selecting these to be the canon, but we're getting together as the authority figures under God in Israel to say, we're officially recognizing these even though they've already existed and we've already been yeah. using them for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of where Jesus came from. And another great way to say, well, does the book belong in the Old Testament? Did Jesus quote from it? Right. right. Because if we believe in Jesus, he was... Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I was just saying, and if, yeah, if, if he's referencing... Yes, <laughs> that's, exactly. That's definitely part of it. So as... <clears throat> As that went along, and then we get into the New Testament and the different letters, uh, there's, you know, obviously certain letters from the apostles made it, <laughs> certain ones didn't, mm-hmm. certain writings. Um, some of it was firsthand, some of it was secondhand. Right? Yeah. And so speak to that and how that came about also. Um, and then maybe, yeah, just... Well, there's... There was numerous councils, and I don't think we need to go down trying to name every one of them. We we had some preliminary conversation on this. I think it's important to understand how those various councils, though, like what was the metric and what was the bar. Now, I'm not going to speak with any authority on that. Ken and Ken or KB can probably speak a little bit better, I think, on what those bars were. But for me, what I've read and what I've found to be fascinating is just the manner in which 
they would go these councils and these these groups of um, religious leaders and that they would go through to make sure that there's authenticity behind what was written, that it matched up with the fact, you know, there was a lot of scrutiny that went into, okay, did Matthew write the gospel of Matthew? Well, when you look at Matthew as a tax collector, this is very well known. Secular writers reference this and know this. Okay. Then you look at Matthew's writings and you see the amount of times that, you know, in other gospels, the same exact scenario would be mentioned but not include maybe specific numbers or dollar amounts for something. But in Matthew, it was. Why? Because he was a tax collector. He cared about money. That was a detail that would matter to him and that he would write. So the fact that it's in his writings lends a lot of credibility to his authorship of those writings. So, you know, in those same principles, um, you know, when you really start to do some separate study on how do we know the Gospels are firsthand accounts of the Gospels, even though... uh, understand that. I know I'm aware that Mark is not a firsthand account. Um, but, you know, how are the Gospels the Gospels, and how do we know that who who is prescribed as writing them did write them? And it's those nuances and, and different um, aspects that were really closely evaluated early early on, you know, second, third uh, century for first. authenticity. Yeah, even first yeah, century. Even first yeah. century. Okay. I mean, they're so, being verified by the apostles. Right. Yeah. And these are, you know, these are very close, yes, um, verifications being done. So just the, the level of scrutiny that our current canonized scripture did go through and the amount of times it's referenced by secular writers who 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 offer a ton of corroboration um, that you wouldn't expect from secular writers at the time, because quite frankly, it didn't it uh, didn't it was no ad- advantage to them that this was true. Um, you know, it was no advantage to the Roman Empire that 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 um, that these were that that Christ was who he said he was. Um, you know, it, but but it was still written about. So and then yes, the council you, basically are the works inspired? Are they consistent with you know for other for the for the rest of the New Testament? Are they are they believed to be inspired and consistent with the gospels? You know, just the level of care and scrutiny that went into deciding all of that, I think it can give us a pretty good le- level of um confidence in that. But I, I have a feeling KB and Ken probably have better information on that. Do you want to go first? No, go ahead. Okay. Um so much like the Old Testament, the with the rabbis got together and basically said, we're officially recognizing these. If you want to summarize the, the councils that happened in the second and the third centuries, and four, most of those were like, were officially recognizing that these things have been used and recognized by all Christians since the time we called ourselves Christians. Mm-hmm. Uh, a fun fact is you can actually go back and examine the, the people who were alive during the first century AD and second century AD. So these would be disciples of John, yeah. disciples of the apostles right. yeah. who wrote about these things mm-hmm. and wrote prolifically about these things in great detail. Uh, a fun fact, though, is you can actually recreate the entirety of the New Testament just by evaluating the quotations of Scripture mm-hmm. in those first and right. second century writers' writings. And those texts, those documents actually exist. Many, Many of those of them, documents still exist They're in from, museums. from Clement and other stuff. Yes. Now, as far as I'm aware of, no official public original manuscripts of the original books of the New Testament are, are still in right. existence. Right. It's the they might secondary. be in their secondary tertiary copies yep. of yeah. it. There might be some in some private collection in some place that we'll never see or never know yeah, exist, yeah, right. yeah. Sure. or in the Vatican or wherever. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I feel like they probably would have paraded that around. Yeah. I digress. <laughs> um, the fact is, these original books, the books that we call the New Testament, yeah. were used by the earliest Christians, um, even when the apostles themselves were still alive, mm-hmm. let alone their first and second order disciples after them. Yeah. It gives the greatest authenticity that these were the books here. Now, there's also, and I don't have it memorized, many different criteria that those further councils went back and looked with to say, make sure, all right, well, that's what they used. Let's go back and measure it by metric A, B, C, D, E, and see if it measures up. Because there's other gospels that are out there, like the so-called Gospel of Thomas. 
well, that says some really funky, crazy crap. Like when <laughs> Jesus was resurrected, not only yeah. did he come out of the tomb, but the cross followed him floating behind him out of the tomb. And then as their people were there, it became gigantic and the cross reached up to heaven and a whole bunch of other crazy crap. Yeah. There's reasons book like books like that didn't make it into the New Testament. Yes. And the fact that there are three copies of that known to exist. And there are literally thousands and tens of thousands of copies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Corinthians, yeah. what have you. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands of copies of those. One of this, three of that, the Gospel of Mary, yeah. the Gospel of Thomas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the thing. Even the Gospel of Thomas, one of the reasons it's also not in there, never mind its craziness, but I don't think that they, through the layers that they went through to establish um, authorship and, and authenticity, like it didn't, I don't know that, the gospel according to Thomas, what what very little exists of it, might not have actually even been Thomas's writing. It I mean, might have been falsely prescribed was. to him. Yeah, it was actually right. most likely written about later because it wasn't even in the writings of yes. the original first and second century writers like right. yeah. Clement yeah. and Arrhenius. And ex right. you know, it didn't exist in those writings. Yeah. Right. It, and that's that's the point that I wanted to make um, as far as that goes. Like, what's the reason that it had to be canonized? Because within a short period of time, mm -hmm. you start having false teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now we're having like the Nicolaitans and, you know, some different <laughs> groups that are mentioned in the New Testament where they're coming out. We've got, you know, prominent false teachers that are starting to come out that are starting to kind of get on the, you know, Christianity bandwagon for whatever reason, uh, because really it was not a bandwagon you wanted to get on, you know, by the time Nero came around. Um, but <laughs> and, you know, it, but it, it changed quick. Yeah. But you've got people get trying to get on the Christianity bandwagon and false teachers creeping in almost immediately. So the church is thorough and exacting mm -hmm. and, you know, especially early on is being, you know, all the writings are being verified literally by the apostles. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, the, the, being continued to be verified by, you know, their, their, their students yeah. Yeah. and the people that, that they are teaching directly. And it, while it's not necessarily instantaneously formalized and canonized, it is still verified thoroughly and continue to be verified those same books, mm -hmm. you know, for the next 200 and what, 60 odd years or 270 yeah. odd years. So before it is, you know, formally canonized and, and put to formally is, is the yes. right word there. Right. And if all of that wasn't enough for someone, you know, the scrutiny that these works went through, there's the fact that even secular writings corroborated mm -hmm. the, the fact that numerous, not just the 12, but outside of the 12 apostles as well, numerous people gave their life to standing on this truth sure mm -hmm. that Christ is who he says he is that he that he conquered death that he rose again that that tomb was empty um you know that that there was an ascension um it, and I don't think yeah I don't think that they're all crazy I don't think they could all uh give as much as they gave standing on this truth, if it wasn't truth, like, like I'm not just a simple man that it's like, Oh, well that, you know, like it, but that is, I mean, never mind all of the other evidence, you know, you can just look right at that and be like that, that many people aren't going to stand on this hill and die for that truth. If there's not truth there. Um, so yeah, if everything else doesn't do it for you, I, I know that's one thing that does it for me. Yeah. And I think there's, and there's also the element of if scripture is the inspired word of God, mm. if there's belief in that, then obviously he had a role <laughs> in, in preserving it, preserving it mm -hmm. and sure. deciding what was in it. Mm -hmm. And it, that was just as much an act of God and, and how that was decided. Um, there's some varying parts to it because and again it it does for every person it's different um because i could i could name a, a lot of religions where people died for it and it's not truth 
Okay. Yeah. Sure. You yep. know. And but again, all the martyrs. Them. Yeah. Well. All, yeah. I would say all of them. Yeah. yeah. But the or well, not all of them, but essentially. Yeah. I mean, the cries of the martyrs that Revelation talks about, like it's there. There is that voice of of those that. Um you know, still followed to their death, mm-hmm. uh, especially the early ones, the, the apostles and everything, because they were there and they witnessed and they saw and they lived through it. And it was confirmed uh, by other secular writings yes. that had no interest in, in Christianity in, it in being, any way, shape, or form. And it form. being true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, it was not think, advantageous for this to be yeah. true. Yeah. I mean, you think the Israelites were meticulous in bookkeeping? I mean, yeah, the... the Talk about the Israelites being meticulous in bookkeeping, like the Roman Empire. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. and it's... there are numerous documents throughout the Roman Empire who were actively persecuting Christians. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, about, you know, what their writings consist yeah. of, you know, their belief systems, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I was remiss in the first video or the first uh, podcast. I didn't get a Lord of the Rings reference, but I'm getting... <laughs> I'm getting the Gandalf mm. in in the records room, you know, and and okay. Minas Tirith. <laughs> yep. You know, he's pouring through all those things, drinking coffee, and he's like, <gasps> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just saying <laughs> <laughs> that that is that is good because uh, I am I am about to wrap up, uh, and I know that there's things that we didn't get to, um, and you know we might save that for another time, uh, or or we might get back to some of that stuff. But uh, it is good that you got your Lord of the Rings. <laughs> well, and before you do that wrap up, because right, so I, I I see where you're going, and we're not going to be able to get to what would have been great to get to, which is an actual full on example of okay, this is how we would approach. Yeah. Um, but achieving, getting to the point of, of biblical literacy and and, ach- and and on a path to to achieve that, I think there's just some elements, some basic tenets or pillars, if you will, to understand, I think, when you approach scripture, because the whole idea of this of this podcast was for for the listener to to kind of gain some enthusiasm towards aspiring uh to achieve a greater biblical literacy. How do you do that? When when you sit down, some of these pillars are and KB and Ken, please uh, uh chime in if I leave something out. But understanding the author, who is the person writing whatever passage it is you're reading? Who are they writing to? Who is their intended audience? Yes, we are all the intended audience at this point. But at the time that Paul was writing um, his letters, he had very unique intended audiences and, and very unique reasons why he was writing to that audience. So ask yourself, you know, who's writing this? Who are they writing to? What was the culture at the time? Um, and then do a little bit of extra Go to Bible Hub. Seriously, get the app. Go to Bible Hub and and look at some of, not all, you'll get lost in it, but look at some of the Greek words and understand what they meant then, not now. And, and you know, find that, you know, the Greek word for, for fornication, which was pornea, which meant a, you know, a violation of a covenant, not necessarily what you might think that word means in its current English uh, form now. Um, that's just one very small example that came to mind, but there's so many different ways. Dig deeper into some of the language that was used at the time. Um, understanding all of these different pillars and aspects of what you're reading, and then and then dive into the actual scripture and see if it doesn't maybe hit you in a different way. Knowing, okay, he wrote that letter to the Galatians because of that specific reason. They were struggling with something, and it mattered uh, to him that the Galatians... Um, heard um, these words in this way. Um, and it was different than what the Corinthians uh, struggled with and etc. So just understanding those differences and understanding that context and the cultural context um, can really change what you get out of that scripture. And if you read a passage and you're like, I have no idea what they're talking about, then, then go back and, and look at those things and maybe read it again. I would add to that. Yeah. Also an understanding of what the author writing had as an understanding of redemptive history, mm-hmm. because what Abraham knew was different than what Moses knew, sure. was different yep. than what David knew, was different <clears throat> than what John knew when he wrote yes. the book of Revelations. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. And it changes all across there, and God's not changing. 
but our understanding the, as you said the culture with which you're understanding mm-hmm. is absolutely changing did you have somewhere to go no like i i very much agree with that and the other thing is is like not every letter paul wrote is in the bible right yeah. right <laughs> yeah not every letter that an apostle wrote is in the Bible. Yep. Like there's also, and this goes back to the descriptive prescriptive, the Holy Spirit <laughs> led, you know, God ordained what did make it and what did. Sure. Many different groups and, so, and many different men. <clears throat> part of it, like you were saying is that, like also looking at all of it at the overall narrative of the redemptive work mm-hmm. that God had from the beginning and will eventually in his return do. And, and where does all of that lie um, and the overall narrative of it? And I, I think there's, there's a lot of importance in that and also remembering that it's in there because God intended it to be, right. you mm-hmm. know? Right. Yeah. I mean, um, you look at, and I know this was something else we were going to talk about where we kind of unfortunately had to gloss over, but I mean, the book of James. Yeah. Like Pro- Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther did not want the book of James yeah. in the Bible. James almost got the ax. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of my but, favorite books. But the book of James is in the Bible. Yeah. yeah. Like and God, so, God yeah. wanted, regardless of what Martin Luther wanted, right. yeah. James is in the Bible. You know, <laughs> right. like, yep. and, and I yep. think it goes, it also goes to, to remind us that we as humans can get funny. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, and this is just a real quick example. Uh, a decade ago, uh, there was a, another local pastor and I was not in ministry. So maybe it was more like 12 or 15 years ago. And they asked, hey, so what are you studying right now? And I said, Esther. Oh, well, that's a waste. <laughs> like that that book shouldn't even have made it. God's not even mentioned. Yeah. Like, and, and I, I vividly remember sitting there being like, oh, so this person when pressed, would not say, my ways are above God's ways. Right. Well, what he was saying in saying that was, right. I know better. Yeah. yeah. And like, mm. okay. Yeah. I was like, are you serious? Mm. And and they very much were. Yeah. And I just moved on. I'm like, right. okay. Like that's, yeah, that doesn't matter. Well, and again, it's, yeah. And <clears throat> Luther with James. It's like, you know, and didn't I- want it. I know we're wrapping up. I was just going to go off script really quick here. Yeah, do it. But um, what would be something, each of you guys, what would be something for the people that are listening? What is an easy first step? So if they want to- Ken, get, maybe you have the gift of prophecy. And I don't, I don't mean to be- <laughs> there, I there was <laughs> Yeah, I don't. That, that was what I was wrapping up to. Oh, all right. Was asking that exact thing. So what's- Boom. You have 30 seconds and I'm moving on. Okay. But what one take away? I don't like that. Yeah. Well, uh, so it doesn't get 10 minutes each person again. (laughs) But like, what's the one takeaway you want to give people? Uh, I would say, and this is a fairly simple thing. um, Get a good study Bible. Yeah. It doesn't Uh, have to be a MacArthur study Bible. That's okay. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, get get a good study Bible. Yeah. And I mean, that, that is a great tool. Um, really indispensable. Yep. Um, it's heavier. So, yeah. you know, you might need to get a backup Bible. And you but, look, you look more holy with it. Yeah, you definitely you know, do. Yeah. We yeah. always yeah. joked about that. <laughs> no, but bound I, I love that. Absolutely. Get a study Bible. It is a, it is a great resource to have. Uh, my thought would be don't, don't neglect the forest for the trees, but don't neglect the tree for the forest. Um, when you're studying the Bible, keep that thousand foot view of mm-hmm. this is God's handbook and marching orders and telling yeah. us what he's going to do to that entire narrative of the Bible is getting us back to the Garden of Eden, mm-hmm. getting us back to that relationship we had with yeah. God. Don't lose sight of that. Don't lose sight of the promises that he's given us. But at the same point in time, don't be afraid to deep dive into something. Mm-hmm. So well, one of my favorite, you can, you can study the Bible and 99% of it you can get without knowledge of Greek or Hebrew. Mm. But there are certain things that are really helpful. Yes. One of my favorites is in Ephesians 6. 
the sword of the spirit. Everybody says that's the Bible. That is the logos right here. That's not the word logos. The word is rhema. And what that means is it's what the spirit does inside of you when you read the word of God. Yeah. It is what God does inside of you. It's the quickening of your spirit when you're doing that. And so don't shy away from looking at the bark on the trees or the leaves on the trees, but don't only focus on that. Don't deep dive into something so much that you lose view of God's promise, his love for us, and the fact that he wants that relationship like we had in the garden with mm. him. Yeah. Mm. Man. Yeah, that's, well, that's all tough to That's only more than 30 seconds. No, Sorry. Yeah. Appreciate you making it tough to follow up. But so what, no I, what I would come with is be assertive to get outside of your comfort zone. Uh, some of the greatest growth that I've had in my approach to study is when I was going to be leading a Bible study or a Sunday mm-hmm. school class or something yeah, to that definitely. effect. It forced me into looking at it deeper. It forced me into coming up with questions that would be conducive to conversation about the topic of the passage. And it forced me to, to learn, to dive in and look at it differently because um, I don't want to sound like an idiot. Absolutely. Yeah, it's something it that I'm self-conscious <laughs> about. Um, so, you know, that, that taught me to become a lot more studious in my approach to being biblically literate and fluent. Um, so get out of your, get out of your box, go lead something, ask your small group leader or Sunday school group teacher. Hey, could I teach a class at some point? Give it a shot. You might be surprised how much you like it. Yeah. Uh, and I'll wrap up with this real quick thing as, as you're diving into the word and it goes along with what you said, KB a little bit, um, as you're diving into the word and seeking understanding, make sure you have the, the correct starting point. You are not the main character. Yes. Like you are not the main character in your own story. Yeah. Right. Like it, and, and that's where we get so screwed up. <laughs> we, we try to look at everything in scripture through our lens and, and we're just not the main character. <laughs> so, um, America suffers from main character syndrome. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I mean, we, we as a nation yep. sure. think we're the main character. You know, like, yep. <laughs> that's, that's, oh man. Okay. I mean, kind so, of yeah. As, <laughs> as that, that, the whole, oh, you want to talk about a rabbit trail. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. So thank you guys for the discussion. Uh, thank you uh, for everyone that joined us. Um, I want to encourage you again with those things we ended with. And, and more than anything, continue to seek God. Um, seek him with all of your heart. Uh, he will reveal himself to you. He promises that. And so that is that is the, the great comfort that if we continue to seek him, we will find him. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, Federated Squared Circle Wrestling with God's Word. We will see you next week. And uh, thank you for the conversation once again, guys. And... Mm-hmm. Uh, We will talk to you later.